to Soul Therapy Anointed Radio. I'm your host, Harry Coast, and you'll be with me in this hour as we journey through Soul Therapy together. My heart is a sinking ship waiting to splash. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to Soul Therapy, a program on the Luke 418 radio station, which is the leading cutting edge of Christian radio worldwide on the internet. I'm your host, Carrie Coast, and I am with you on this journey, as always, to bless your path. What I want to do here is point you to Jesus, my very favorite person, Jesus is real, Jesus is God, and he loves you more than you could imagine. He loves all of us with a tenderness toward our hearts. I'm talking about a tenderness that he has toward us as his delicate children. Yes, he knows exactly how delicate we actually are. There's a Bible verse that suggests we give our lives to him. So listen, Mark 1, verse 15 says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What does repent mean? Well, if you look at the Hebrew version of it, it's basically saying, turn around, as in you're going the wrong way. And truly, without Jesus, as what we're walking toward, we are going a very misguidedly bad wrong way. I'm here to suggest this very thing that Mark 1 verse 15 says, repent and believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ. What's so good in the good news about Jesus Christ? Well, it's what he and only he can do for us. Jesus was all about relationships. Did you know that? Among the many other things that he came to earth to do, he sought to restore our broken relationship with God. It's really common to have a wrong God image. It's very common to blame God for the bad things in the world, the disappointments we face, the things that people do to us, even our own shortcomings. And Jesus is God. He sought to restore our broken relationship with God. If you have never given your life to Jesus, then why not now? And if you have, then why not now again? Let's declare this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God and you are able to do anything as God and that you have been chasing after me to call you my God and I call you my God now. And I say now that I will give my life to you. I will trust you. Your love never fails. It's written and it is true that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah and amen. Isn't that nice? When we have consistency, we have the most perfect consistency in Jesus Christ. So listen to this. It is written in the book of Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, I'll say it again. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you just made that declaration, giving your life to Jesus, welcome to the kingdom of God. We keep working at this. 
working out our salvation, as Paul said in the second chapter of the book of Philippians. So you may want to contact the Luke 418 radio station website to let us know, especially if you wisely want help with walking out your salvation. If you need prayer, or if you just want to share this good news about your decision with us. Again, that's the Luke 418 radio station website. Know that your relationship with God, once restored, means that other sins have to be cleaned up. So this is a thing about salvation. Working it out means, first that we restore our relationship with God, and then we work on cleaning ourselves up. This turns out to be very important. By giving our lives to Jesus, this means that we have repented. We've repented of a foundational sin of denying who God is. Being born again means all the other sins have to go. But this is where we start on this path of working out our salvation, which Paul often called the good fight that we should fight or the race that we should win working toward the prize. And it is certain that there are good rewards for right choices and terrible consequences for wrong choices. We are no longer living in sin as people who choose Jesus, but we're imitating him. We're seeking to become more like him every day. And I'm going to name several verses. Do you want to write them down? These are verses that can help you understand what I'm saying more deeply. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 20. The book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 9. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 5. The book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and I'm saying among other scriptures to get started in living a right life or as a good practice if you've been on that road a while. We're talking about a life that leads to a clean conscience. A heavy conscience is a hard thing to have. We want to work toward having a clean conscience it is so freeing. A freeing feeling is a life where every day we make God more real and more the center of our lives. And amazing transformations start to happen. We discover wonderful things and we learn to love God more as we realize who He truly is, how much love and care He gives us, no matter how we're behaving. He's still loving and caring for us. And how much better his ideas are than our own. How terrible things are because of that human tendency, which we're all subject to having, to not follow his instructions. I'm talking about disobeying God's instructions. Such as what happened in the Garden of Eden a long time ago. We call that the fall of man and that was not the last time, sadly, the people fell for Satan's tricks. That's the bottom line here. We want to get out of falling for his tricks, which he does, because he wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. So let's focus on just how great our God is. How do you like that? As always, let's look at attributes of God and names of God. And this time, what I'm going to do is have two words, two attributes that work together. And maybe you could say that's like salt and pepper, perhaps not the best comparison, but here are the words, the lion and the lamb. The lion and the lamb. I'll start by describing a little card that I have. It's about three by five inches. And on this little card, it's so beautiful. It shows a deep, dark blue sky, one bright and shining star. And 
on this plush lawn of healthy grass about a few inches tall is a beautiful, majestic, amber-colored lion gazing at the star. Cuddled up next to the lion is a perfect, adorable little white lamb. The lamb could not look more vulnerable nor more relaxed. The lion of Judah, or in Hebrew, Aryeh Yehuda. The lion of Judah, Aryeh Yehuda, means many things. For Israel, it symbolizes both the Jewish nation and the Jewish culture. It also represents the tribe of Judah, one of the 12 tribes talked about in the Old Testament. So this tribe descends, as all of these tribes do, and there are 12, from the patriarch Jacob. Specifically, it represents the descendants of Judah. Judah was Jacob's fourth son. And in Genesis chapter 49, verses 8 through 12 give us a sneak preview of this lion. Read it. If you haven't in a while, great idea. And what do you see when you read it about this descendant of Judah? This is Jesus, our Messiah. We see that he will be praised by all. He will rule over all people with an everlasting kingdom. He will crush his enemies. He will be feared for his power and no one will be able to challenge his throne. They will not be powerful enough. They will not be worthy enough. Yes, this is Jesus. Who else? He's shown in what's called a forerunner or a prototype, a foreshadow. Many songs have been written about Jesus as the lion. Jesus as regal and majestic and powerful and fearless. He could destroy us for our sins, but his love for us is so great. So instead, he becomes for us the lamb. What about that lamb? He is so tender. The tender heart of Jesus, isn't that what melts us for him? In fact, an author pastor named Brennan Manning said, it was really the tenderness of the lamb that brought many of us to God. As I said, he could destroy us for our sins. But he's so gentle in his love toward us. His heart of love is to give up his life, to do the suffering for us. Innocent, guiltless, worthy to give up his life for us. There's a worship song by a Christian man named John Foreman. And just speaking from my own reaction, it depicts this combination of lion and lamb so well, out even using those words, lion or lamb. The lyrics say, Two things you told me, the you being the Lord, you are strong, and you love me. The strength of a lion, that is Jesus above any human ever. And the tenderness of a lamb, that is the strength of a lion. A lion that is Jesus above any human ever. The strength of a lion That is Jesus above any human ever. And the tenderness of a lamb, that is, his love is like the tenderness of a lamb. Your love is strong, goes the refrain. And then we hear, the kingdom of heaven is buried treasure. Would you sell yourself? Would you sell yourself to buy the one you found. So I ask you, would you? Would you sell yourself to buy the one you found? How strong, 
How fierce must our love be to do that for another? You may have someone in mind that you absolutely feel that strong and fiercely about, and you can see in your heart how tender as a lamb that must feel within your heart. And well, that's the power of the song, especially in the hands of a sentimental person. You're listening to Carrie Coast on the Soul Therapy Program of the Luke 418 radio station, where we're now talking about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and we're talking about Jesus as the Lion. We're talking about Jesus as the Lamb. We are talking about the God who we serve, who is both Lion and Lamb. This is a godly pairing of words. And sometimes in life we feel like a lamb facing a lion. Have you felt that way? Have you felt it often? In a very gentle way, I want to introduce the topic of how can I heal? How can I heal? I say gentle because nothing about what happened that needs to be healed is easy or pleasant at least speaking for myself and for anyone I know. So we're talking about healing of the mind, the will, and the emotions. We're talking about the stress-body connection. We're talking about trauma. And I work with that topic on a daily basis. So I know to avoid language that may trigger you. What I'm trying to do here is to inform you. So let's look at trauma. What is it? And I will say it this way. Trauma is when we encounter something that we perceive as dangerous to our very lives. Trauma is something we encounter that we perceive as dangerous to our very lives. Trauma typically involves feelings of powerlessness or of lack of control. And here's a general definition. Trauma is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, a rape, a natural disaster, an emotional response to a terrible event, a single stressful or dangerous event is a trauma. Trauma can be a single event such as a natural disaster, witnessing or experiencing an act of violence, facing a terrible setback or a loss. These are just some examples. Now, some mental health practitioners call these one-time traumatic experiences big T types of trauma. Big trauma, big T types of trauma. Again, big T meaning something big that happened one time. These big T traumas are considered acute A-C-U-T-E, acute traumas, meaning very intense. But trauma can also be many small but terrible feeling experiences. And this is the chronic type. It can be called little t, small t traumas. Just some things that psychologists may say. So this type of trauma that is chronic is something that a person may experience not as intensely, but more frequently. It's often something chronic. It just keeps going on. And these are not nice things, like not having friends at school for a child, being homeless, ongoing witnessing of violence against a family member, being shunned or shamed regularly, neglect. Now, if any of this topic triggers you, I'm asking that you contact a good mental health practitioner or the Luke 418 Counseling Center if you do not have one. Again, a good mental health practitioner or the Luke 418 Counseling Center. Now, trauma does not only mean physical harm. Trauma can be physical, but it could also be emotional, psychological. It can be financial. It can be spiritual. It can be social. Not sure if you've ever thought about that or experienced it. So some examples of this. 
emotional trauma, which is quite common, comes from events or experiences that leave us feeling profoundly unsafe, profoundly helpless. And it can lead to low self-esteem, hopelessness, depression. It can lead to anxiety, anger, psychological harm, many consider to be the worst type there is. That's an affliction of powerlessness. These experiences can overwhelm us. Mind games, that is, things that cause us to question our own sanity, to make the mind crack. Again, this is Carrie Coast on the Soul Therapy Program of the Luke 418 radio station. And I'm asking, what happens from trauma? We've talked about big T traumas, which are acute traumas, very intense. We've talked about little t traumas, which are smaller, not as intense, but they keep happening. Both are equally bad, equally bad, equally difficult to recover from. So response to trauma is extremely varied among individuals. Often, right after an event that is traumatic, we experience shock and denial. There's usually the expression, I feel numb. I don't know what I feel. Somebody who's just experienced a trauma and who's asked, how are you, is often going to give a blank stare. They may not be able to even access words to describe what they feel. Longer-term reactions can include really unpredictable experiences. Unpredictable experiences such as very intense emotions, flashbacks, nightmares, night terrors, problems in relationships, physical symptoms like headaches, nausea. Some other things that people report. Shock, as I said, and denial, but also sadness. It can be even deep grief, anxiety, repeated thoughts, intrusive thoughts, fear, terror, depression. Anger is common. The complete avoidance of emotions and denial of the emotions is common. Being irritable, being agitated, numbness and dissociation are really common. And we dissociate all, dissociate to some extent in different ways. So that includes when we're spacing out. That includes when someone comes up and talks to us and we're so engrossed in something that we're startled. That includes if you have a car driving somewhere, maybe driving home from a job, and upon arriving home, not even knowing how you got there because of being completely detached from the reality experience of driving and in inside the thoughts, inside the head. So many other things. Difficulty concentrating. Difficulty controlling emotions. That problem of being very reactive and not being able to exercise self-control. Maybe having a lot of regret that comes from that. Loss of hope. The certainty that the future has been shortened, that it's over that there's no point in going on. Headaches, nausea, exhaustion, a startle response of being really jumpy, being easily startled, even in sweating, trouble sleeping, having regular crying that is difficult to control, and, and from that feeling embarrassed, gastrointestinal issues, stomach pain, tight muscles, shortness of breath, a racing heart. And these funny words, derealization and depersonalization, which have to do with feeling like this reality is weird. I don't even really understand where I am. Or depersonalization when one's own body feels strange. One looks at one's hand and says, wow, my hand looks strange doesn't even feel like a part of me. Another category of trauma is complex trauma. Have you heard of that? 
Complex trauma is when we're exposed to a variety and many traumatic events. And often these are invasive and they may be of an interpersonal nature, meaning in the dealings with other people. Now it's said that PTSD is not what most people experience after trauma. Now I think that's hard to say because not everyone has the option or desire to seek treatment. And without that, I don't know how we can be sure that statistics are correct, even close. And there's something even more difficult, and that is complex PTSD. So PTSD is going to have many of those symptoms that I described earlier, such as the headaches, the intrusive thoughts, the nightmares, the sweating, the heart palpitations. PTSD is difficult and it is often from some more contained types of experience having had a bad series of things happen in a war setting. Complex PTSD or CPTSD is another level. That's rooted usually in a lifetime of terrifying experiences, often from early childhood. They can even be while we're in the womb. Yes, while we're in the womb. Babies can go through a lot before they're even born. So the real challenge about this topic is that none of this is unusual. These are common human experiences. Traumatic events occur in every person's life story. So why don't we see it? We don't see it because humans adapt. Part of adapting may be that we don't even talk about it. We just keep moving on, and what has happened can be hidden within us. Many people never share their stories with anyone. How we adapt can be something helpful. It can be unhelpful. And have you noticed that there are certain kinds of pain that run in families? Domestic violence, incest, addiction, homelessness, poverty, divorce, war, family breakups, psychosis, fear, anger, shame, developmental challenges. And why is this? Long after a terrible event, traumatized people relive the event. I'll say it again, long after a terrible event, traumatized people relive the event. Relive it until we are really healed. Now, speaking as a Bible-based person who is serving the Lord Jesus and as someone who is a mental health practitioner, I can't help but notice the difference between healing within a lifetime that's devoted to Jesus and one that is not. Long after a terrible event, traumatized people relive the event. This means it's being played out in generations of pain, in unhealed generations. So I will say this again. Long after a terrible event, with traumatized people reliving the event, it can get played out so that it passes from one generation to another. Have you seen that? Have you identified it in your own life? Have you wondered? Have you asked yourself, wow, it's like I'm cursed or something? Well, this is generational pain, and these are terrible things to inherit. These are terrible things to give or receive, terrible things to pass down. So let's take a look at some aspects of this legacy. First of all, human beings are wired for survival. And you know that already. We're wired for survival. Our brains have ways to help us survive. So put your hands on top of your head if you possibly can. Top part of your head. That's the part we use to solve problems. That's the part we use for the most part to create strategies. For the most part, to imagine 
So the top of the head is the problem-solving, strategic, and imaginative part. The top is the problem-solving, strategic, and imaginative part. Now, I know that I am grossly understating what our brains do. Also, I am not a brain specialist, so take my explanations with a grain of salt because I'm trying to boil them down so that we can understand how it ties in to the part I do deal with as a mental health practitioner and as a servant of Jesus. Now I'll talk about the midbrain. The midbrain is kind of in the middle of the head. It has a lot to do with emotions. The midbrain is the emotional memory center. And the midbrain, as the emotional memory center, is where a lot of things go on when it comes to a perception that we have danger of any type. And it doesn't have to really be a life-threatening danger. It can be something that disturbs us, that creates fear. It could be an unexpected bill that comes in the mail. It could be running into somebody that we perceive is not for us but against us. Now, the brainstem is another part. So I'm talking three parts, the top of the head, the midbrain, and the brainstem. So the brainstem connects the brain to the spinal cord. The spinal cord connection in the brain is like a stalk. S-T-A-L-K, a a stalk. What is the spinal cord? The spinal cord is your spine running down your back. And the brainstem sits toward the bottom of your brain, connecting to the spine. The brainstem is part of your central nervous system. What I want to emphasize is that the top of the head has the more logical and imaginative abilities. The middle of the brain has more emotional activities. And toward the bottom, the brain stem is part of the central nervous system or command center. So that's going to involve the body more than the other parts do. And what does all this have to do with trauma and healing? The midbrain instinctively reacts to alarm. And remember, it's the emotional part. It reacts to alarm. Now we've got the heart beating faster because of alarm. We've got breathing that either stops or becomes shallow, like a dog panting, like hyperventilation. We get tight muscles. We may speed up or we may shut down. So I will say this again. The midbrain, the emotional part, instinctively reacts to alarm. The heart beating faster, the hyperventilation or shallow breathing, the tight muscles. All of this is important to pay attention to. Healing means paying attention to when your body does this. We heal because we notice things that are happening as best as we can. So I'm going to repeat this. The top of the head is the problem-solving, strategic, and imaginative part. The midbrain has a lot to do with emotions and is the emotional memory center. The midbrain is the emotional memory center. Got that? Now, the brainstem connects the brain to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord is your spine running down your back. The brainstem sits toward the bottom of the brain and is part of your central nervous system. What I want to emphasize is these logical and imaginative... What I want to emphasize is these logical and imaginative abilities versus the emotional abilities, versus the central nervous system. And what does all this have to do with trauma and healing? Well, the midbrain, the emotional part, acts like a smoke detector. I'll just use that as a metaphor. It's sounding the alarm for things to shut down. Now, have you heard of the fight, flight, freeze response? If you've listened to my other programs, you probably have. When we are in this 
response, a part of the brain, which is in the midbrain, is the autonomic nervous system, and it's overruling access to the top of the head. Therefore, we can't think. We later regret that and say, I just stood there stupidly, I couldn't think. Or, I should have not fought, but I couldn't think. I should have not run away, but I couldn't think. We can't. We can't think. We can't always observe or notice either. We haven't got time. At least that's what the body thinks when all that fast heartbeat, shallow breathing, and tight muscles happen. We are either using the thinking brain or the emotional brain. We have this reciprocity in terms of those two main parts. Either we're doing a lot of work in the thinking brain, and that happens when we feel safe, and therefore our body is calm. The thinking brain works when we feel safe, and the body is calm. We are curious. We notice. We observe. We organize. We solve problems. We decide. We remember the past, we prioritize. All this can happen from the top of the brain when we feel safe and the body is calm. But the emotional brain, that's what's working when we don't feel safe and the body is not calm. So when that happens, we're going to have instinctive reactions occurring in the body, fight, flight, freeze, and people please can sometimes be what happens, depending on our situation. If we're safe enough, but scared, we might be running around trying to figure out how to make people happy as a way to have them not harm us in some way, which could even include social ways. But I'll talk more about that in another episode. So what do we do? What do we do knowing all this? Here's what we do now, ahead of anything. We learn breathing techniques. One of them is called square breathing, and the Navy SEALs use that. If there's any better point of reference than the Navy SEALs, you let me know. They face a lot of dangers, and we thank God and ask God to bless them for what they do to protect us in the United States Square breathing is what the Navy SEALs do. So you can find videos, you can learn it from a therapist, you can read about it on the internet, you can ask somebody who's got a lot of coping skills under the belt. The important thing to do is to practice it every morning and every night. Try to do that. Try to make a daily practice if you can. And practice other skills for coping. Go to therapy Go to groups, if that applies to your life. Pray. Meditation is powerful. I'm not talking about yoga types of meditation. I'm talking about meditating on the word, the way David, King David, said he did. I meditate on your law day and night. It truly helps the mind-body connection become stronger. Stronger. Take good self-care always. So pay attention to your diet, what you drink. Make sure you get good rest. Make sure you socialize. Socializing is vital to self-care. In any moment of trauma, we do the best we can. So if you've encountered a situation that you've had to survive, get help afterward. Don't try to do it on your own because we are not wired to do things that way. We are wired to be in relationship And one of the problems that we have when we've had trauma is being able to forgive ourselves. We don't forgive ourselves because we did the things that our bodies restricted us to doing. Remember, we don't have access to the thinking part of the brain when we have a lot of fear going on, when we have a perception of danger. So we have to forgive ourselves. We have to understand and be very gentle with ourselves. Forgive ourselves for doing the best we could and appreciate it rather than self-criticism, self-anger, self-hatred, self-loathing. 
get help so that you know that what your body did was what it was wired to do. You couldn't think. You could not act. You could not move. How could you have stayed calm? You were wired to survive. You were wired to do the fight, flight, freeze response so that you would survive. And you did. Congratulate yourself on succeeding, on staying alive. It's part of our job as human beings to do that. That is the reason we're wired with these instincts. In some cases, you might have been people-pleasing out of an instinct. That's another fear response, and it's a topic for another day. But I ask you to remember, trauma is a deep wound of the soul. Trauma is a deep wound of the soul. That is the mind, will, and the emotions. We need to be gentle with one another while holding healthy boundaries and be gentle with ourselves while holding healthy boundaries. What does the Bible tell us? Well, as far as healing goes, one of my favorite things is a list, and you can search for this on the internet. It's available freely. And it was put together by our brother in Christ, Neil Anderson. It's a list of scriptures, and it's called Who I Am in Christ, originally compiled by Neil Anderson. All of this is written by God to help us, and he compiled it. So it has three main sections that help us with three main areas of trauma response. I am accepted. I am secure. I am significant. Rather than reading the whole thing, I'll give you one example from each. I am accepted. John 1, verse 12. I am God's child. My friend, do not take that lightly. This is Carrie Coast on the Soul Therapy Program. And I want to remind you, do not take lightly that you are God's child. He's an excellent parent, and as a popular worship song goes, he's a good, good father. It's who he is. And a related verse to that is out of the Psalms, that he is a good father, the giver of every good and perfect gift. He is the father of lights. That's who your father is, and that's therefore who you are. Out of the I am secure category, I am free from condemnation. So we beat ourselves up, we beat others up. Ideally, we don't do either one. We focus on God. We keep putting one step forward the way he tells us to. I am free from condemnation. So if somebody wants to be getting on your case, know that within your spirit, even if the situation isn't one that would be appropriate for you to say that out loud, You can say it to yourself. And this one, this is so important in the category of I am significant because life's ways of hurting us, the knocks that make us trip, cause many of us to think we're not important. We're not worthy of the resources of this world. We're not capable. We're inept. Something that's wrong with us, something that's broken with us, will make us be unlovable. A large part of the pain in this world comes right out of that. But listen to this. Out of Ephesians 2, verse 10, I am God's workmanship. What are some other words for workmanship? Masterpiece is one. I'm a masterpiece that God created. My friends, you are John 1, 12, God's child. You are Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, free from condemnation. You are Ephesians 2, verse 10, God's workmanship. So with that, thank you for listening and learning a little bit about this topic of healing and 
This is Carrie Coast on the Soul Therapy Program of the Loop 418 radio station. I will finish by giving you that blessing out of the book of Numbers 6, verse 24. Something I cherish, something I love to leave you with. And I'm reading from the New King James, and it goes like this. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And just for fun today, I'll even say it in the Hebrew. Yivarek Adonai ve'yishmarekka ya'er Adonai panavaleka ve'chuneka Yis Adonai panavaleka ve'yisimleka shalom. And go and make disciples. Next time, bye-bye. Be sure to share the podcast on your favorite social media channel. 